Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really fascinating guest today involved in creating a better tomorrow. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Ross Urich, who is a program manager uh, at the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health, also known as ARPA-H, uh, which is focused on advancing a high potential, high impact biomedical and health research that is not readily uh, accomplished through traditional uh, research channels, uh, accelerating better health outcomes uh, and targeting some of society's most challenging unmet medical needs. And under ARPA-H, Dr. Urich is responsible for the recently announced NITRO program, or Novel Innovations for Tissue Regeneration in Osteoarthritis, uh, which seeks a variety of new ways to help the body repair itself, its own joints, ultimately with the goal of revolutionizing uh, treatments for O. Way. Uh, Dr. Urich uh, joined ARPA-H in uh, March 2023 uh, from Walter Reed National Military Medical Center uh, and the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences. There he worked as a board-certified oral and maxillofacial surgeon and assistant professor of surgery. Uh, in addition to those roles, he spent 12 years with the U.S. Navy, finishing his tenure as lieutenant commander, and throughout his career has cared for literally thousands of members of the United States Armed Forces at various healthcare facilities. He holds a doctorate in dental medicine from the University of Pennsylvania here in Philly, an MBA from University of Virginia, and completed his surgical residency at, uh, at Walter Reed, uh, did his Bachelor of Science uh, in Biomedical Engineering at Yale University. We're honored to have him with us today. A lot of interesting topics to get into. Uh, Dr. Ross Urich, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you. Excited to be here. Uh, it's great having you. Um, I just love to start off with a little bit uh, of you and your background. You know, I was taking a look through uh, some of your publications from the early days uh, back at Yale when you were uh, publishing on things like Paracan. Uh, delivery of transforming growth factor beta, uh, looking at nanoparticles, um, some really interesting sort of what I'll refer to as combinatorial regenerative medicine work. What, what got you interested in the space to, to start off with? It, it has been a slightly non-traditional path. I will say it's a little circuitous. So I, I went to Yale intentionally to be a biomedical engineer. The program there is fantastic. A lot of them are the protégés of Bob Langer. And so the, the program was building when I went there. And I knew, generally speaking, that I wanted to be a BME. I didn't know what that looked like. And I knew that they had a variety of tracks to include biomolecular engineering. So I actually kind of did a pathfinding mission. Um, I spent a couple summers doing dorsal laminectomies on chick embryos and doing wind canonical signaling pathway research at Robert Wood Johnson. Yep. Uh, that kind of clued my interest into, I like using my hands. I'm not sure how to use this. So there was always the notion that I like working with people, I like research, I like kind of finding that marriage between what we're discovering on the bench top and how that can relate to patients. But I didn't know what that looked like. I mean, when you're 18, 19, 20, you probably don't or shouldn't. So I ended up joining some labs at Yale, got just enamored with the entire pipeline and specialty. Ended up working for Tarek Fahmy's lab there in the paper that you referred to. That was focused more on an autoimmune approach, but using biomolecular design to find a way to prevent autoimmune rejection. Um, and it really clued my thinking into, hey, there's a lot you can do in science. And a lot of those things don't ever make it to the clinic. Right. So as the that's the preamble to the, the long road to now, where I realized fairly quickly that I liked people a little bit more than I liked rat models and chick embryos. And so I, I pivoted directions, ended up joining the military intentionally to become an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. But in the course of doing that, you start to realize that all that cool cutting edge science that's happening on the bench top is not ending up in my hands as a surgeon. So that finding that marriage of where we can optimize and ideate and 
revolutionized the field is what in a very, very short answer led me to our page. Awesome. And, and, you know, we had, you know, a couple of months ago, uh, Dr. Wegerson joined us on the show when the sort of the RPH was initially stood up. Uh, you you just joined a couple of months ago. Um, just say a few words about, um, you know, obviously you're doing a lot of exciting things in terms of the trauma work, the surgery work uh, for Walter Reed. Uh, what um, what was the thing that ultimately sealed the deal for you uh, in saying, hey, I'm, I'm moving over to this this moonshot factory. There's a lot of really cool stuff I can get done there now. Yeah, so in 2000, oh boy, 2017, 18, I was working in Charleston, West Virginia, and we were, as a part of our residency program at the time, we did all the head and neck reconstructive trauma for Charleston Area Medical Center. That was the height of the opiate epidemic, and I started to recognize that surgery in many ways is a service industry. So somebody comes in, we fix the problem, it's very discreet, they leave. It's a rewarding profession. I love it. I'm still an attending at Walter Reed. I'm still a professor at USIS, but the reality is... I couldn't necessarily, and I still can't as a surgeon alone, fix any of those problems. I can't solve the root cause of why somebody came in, and I wasn't really changing the, the care paradigm in any fashion. So I finished my rotations there. I was a chief resident, and I got involved in start at least starting to think about what else can you do as a surgeon outside of surgery, and with surgery as a complementary pathway. Um, that's a bit of an unorthodox approach. Most surgeons finish residency, and they go open practice or go to a hospital, and that's the end of that story. But that, that lingering desire to do something that was bigger and to do something that hopefully had a, a greater impact to positively impact the patient experience and the provider experience weighed pretty large on me. So I finished residency, went down to an aircraft carrier, came back up and decided to get my MBA, trying to do, a, again, the pathfinding. Stumbled upon quite a few doctors who were getting their MBA at the time and, and recognized that I have this very innovative streak that I wanted to explore. So I finished the military, finished surgery at Walter Reed on active duty, and was transitioning into the private sector on what that looked like to be a surgeon interested in the in innovation side, the investing side, and fairly serendipitously met Renee, Dr. Wegerson. And she said, hey, you know, we have this new agency. There's this thing called the program manager. I said, tell me more. And I think within that phone call, I was hooked. And I said, this, this seems like the actual perfect job. Let's go. Yeah. And it's been a nonstop pedal to the metal the entire time since then. Awesome. So now here we are at ARPA age and, and obviously this major unmet medical need has been placed in your lap and we think osteoarthritis. Okay. We don't normally think of the, the, the death that is associated with things like heart disease and cancer, but nonetheless, this affects tens of millions of Americans alone, you know, hundreds of millions around the world. Uh, and on the other hand, and I happen to, you know, my, my own time I spent in the pharmaceutical industry, I was, I was spending time in the tangential area of rheumatoid arthritis, but at least there uh, along with the steroids and the non steroidals, we had some disease modifying drugs. This is an area in a way that, you know, the disease modifying osteoarthritis drug is sort of, we've all missed it. Uh, it's not here yet. Um, talk a little bit about osteoarthritis and a little bit of sort of where we are in sort of the pharmacotherapeutic armamentarium in 2023. Well, surprisingly, my opinion is that we're not where we need to be, and nitro. But the reality is, this is both as a patient and as a provider, the standard of care right now is essentially, you have some variant of OA or arthritis or degeneration inside of a joint. Whether it's one joint or multiple, we'll just for the example of this, use the example of one. So you typically would present to your doctor when you have pain. That doesn't necessarily mean you're at the beginning stages of that disease. In fact, quite the opposite, you've already had some progression of the disease and you're going in just because the pain brings you in. At that point, the options are already somewhat limited. It's we're gonna inject some stuff, we might use what's called Macy for your knee, which is a cartilage regeneration platform, mm -hmm. but it has its limitations and it requires multiple surgeries. But the almost invariable path is that we're telling all of these patients, hey, you're going to need a total joint at some point. The, the adage in surgery is that once you open up a joint, you kind of buy that patient for life or you're caring for them for life. And that's because even when you replace a joint 15, 10, 20 years later, we're likely saying we're going to have to go back in and replace it again. The problem comes in when you have somebody who's 40, let's say, and needs that knee replacement after running on it all the time. And all of a sudden, we're replacing it again at 60 and replacing it again at 80. And all that scar tissue is built up and they're kind of out of runway. But they're going to live longer. They're just going to have pain and dysfunction. So that standard needs to be addressed. And th the generation of Nitro was saying you have two discrete patient populations there. You have the patient population who they're not yet at needing a joint replacement. 
but they definitely have tissues that could be regenerated. And those two tissues are bone and cartilage. Let's say we can regenerate all of that back to square one. And there's a distinction between regeneration and repair. Repair is essentially putting a Band-Aid on. Regeneration is convincing your body to repair it itself. So we, we focus on that as population one. Population two are the people who need that total joint, whether it's because of a car accident or just degeneration or obesity-related change. And then we actually have to replace the joint. In that situation, the best we can offer should not be a titanium alloy joint where we're saying come back in 20 years. The perspective of the program is let's do a once and done. Let's give you either patient-specific your cells or patient-specific allogeneic or same species, not you, cells, and say, you get this and that is it. And you go home. Mm -hmm. So in addition to pharmacotherapeutic stuff that is, you know, not not uh, um, where we want it to be. And as you were just explaining, sort of the current surgical practice, um, we have had, I mean, this is, I, I think of nitro, and we'll get into that in a minute uh, as the next generation, but we had had the early sort of generations of regenerative medicine uh, as it pertains to OA. And I know uh, some of the challenges there have been things like, um, you know, okay, we have bone, we have cartilage, uh, but we got to make sure that if we regenerate them, that the bone goes the right place, the cartilage goes the right place and, and everything in between, uh, we got to have the right size and structure and all that bit. Talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you've seen in, in your own work and in studying the regenerative medicine space in terms of uh, where we've fallen short with regenerative medicine to date for OA. I think you actually highlighted two things that are perfect. One is why this is necessarily ARPA hard and not something that's purely an investment, let's set it and forget it in a different structure of, of financing. The other is we have things called enabling technologies. What that means is we have areas of the science that suggest we could get there, but it's not there yet. So we can regenerate some cartilage. Oftentimes there's an anecdotal regeneration of bone. They're oftentimes done in kind of a once and done approach as opposed to tactically breaking them out and saying, you know, somebody might not need bone regeneration, but they might need cartilage regeneration. So to say, we're just gonna put a sledgehammer on the situation, I don't think is sufficient. So in doing the landscape analysis of our um, academic partners, industry partners, the entire landscape across the US of where OA regeneration is, and also where tissue regeneration is writ large, we found that there are a lot of gaps, but there's a lot of promise to your point. So if we take all of that and we say, hey, if it's going to take 15, 20 years to get there, what do we need to do to make it happen in five? Mm -hmm. And that's really what, what creates that ARPA hard problem of, it's not just an acceleration, it's not just that we need to get money on target to solve this problem, it is really the perfect symphony as, I think that Renee has described it as we're the rational risk takers as the PMs, but we're also kind of the conductors. We have to conduct this orchestra of seemingly disparate instruments to get them all to play music. So if somebody does cartilage regeneration well, if you'll look in the program, if you do that well, that's great. That's not actually the full complement of the program. You have to do bone and cartilage together. Mm -hmm. So this is really a teaming environment where we say there are component parts and pieces all over the place. Let's work together and make this happen, keeping with the metrics of the program. And that's what may, I think makes this incredibly challenging and rewarding and optimistic. And I'm optimistic for what's going to happen next. So let's let's talk a little bit about Nitro, because I, I know that uh, a few weeks ago you had your, your first proposers. I think this was ARPH's first proposers day in general, but you had the Nitro proposers day. Um, and, and for everyone listening, watching, you can go watch uh, the, the presentation on the Internet. Uh, and, you know, here you outline three areas, uh, injectable bone regeneration, injectable cartilage regeneration, so sort of the, the in vivo approaches. And then the third set of approaches, the uh, ex vivo development of replacement joints from from human cells. Uh, Talk just a little bit about the structure of where the program is today, you know, who's, you know, how one shows up, how one proposes and all that. And then we'll get into some of the, the details of, of, of the different uh, portfolio items. Sure. So we are early stages in that we have not picked any performers. We're still waiting for proposals. Proposal deadline is in nine days. Excellent. So proposers or proposers day was an opportunity for the relevant stakeholders in the space who actually think that they can accomplish the metrics of the program to meet in one space, hear about the program, hear about the state of affairs of regenerative medicine across the country, and then also give them the opportunity to team and have some face time. So it was, it's it's very condensed time with the people who are the primary personnel who might be performers with no leaning one way or the other industry, academia, develop product or not. So then that goes into proposal review, which has not, again, not happened yet because we're waiting for the proposals. 
And then we'll finally have an idea of who our performers are and we'll update the industry when that happens. In terms of the structure for the program and what I alluded to earlier, we require, we strongly encourage teaming. It's not required. There are teams who I think might be able to do it, but the reality is these are ambitious goals. Nobody's doing this appropriately and certainly nobody's doing it in keeping with our program. So we mentioned group one and group two in the patient population. Group one needing that what we call technical areas. So technical area one is regeneration of subchondral bone, the bone inside of your joint. Technical area two is regeneration of the cartilage inside of your joint. And even within that, you have to do or create an intraarticular, so in the joint bone regenerative, an intraarticular in the joint cartilage regenerative, and a systemic cartilage regenerative. And those three things comprise TA1 and 2 as a group in the program. So the performer structure is you can pick one of three options. You do TA1 and 2, which is that bone and cartilage I just discussed, TA3, which I'll get to in a minute, and then the entire thing. So you can do TA1, 2, and 3. So TA3 is that group two, the population who have no choice but to regenerate or replace the joint. So for that population, we're talking about the allogeneic and autogenous. We're starting with total knee. So the performers have to produce a total knee that is allogeneic. So same species using that cells, patient specific and critically no permanent fixation and a return to function in four to six weeks. So you can see in all of this, anyone in surgery would say those are all paradigm care shifts. That's allogeneic, and then the autogenous is the same exact criteria, except it has to be totally patient-specific. The timelines, however, are different. So in a patient who comes in, they have massive trauma or avulsive trauma, and they need that allogeneic joint immediately, they're given, the performers are given 24 hours to produce that. For a patient who has minimal comorbidities to no comorbidities, and they can afford to wait, they're given 30 days to produce a totally patient-specific autogenous joint. So you, you start to see that even if somebody says, I can do a bone regenerative, or I can do a piece of bone, to be able to create an entire joint with no fixation or no permanent fixation, returning to function quickly. And there's also a pain component here of less than three out of 10 on the visual analog scale, which is tied into our opiate issue, which is also kind of the, the wicked problem moving in the background of OA. Yeah. These become pretty quickly difficult problems that require industry group thing to find the solutions to at least. And uh, talk about how the teaming works or something like this, because clearly, you know, if uh, um, and once again, I'm, I'm thinking back to your, your work in, in, in biomaterials. But if, you know, if you need to bring together experts and growth factors and uh, uh, extracellular matrix and an expert in synovial fluid or I mean, obviously there's there's all these different things that are happening. It's a very we might think the joint the joint is a pretty complex microenvironment. And so how, do, how does that all work? So you, you basically, uh, you don't team the people together, right? It's up to them to form the team to say, hey, we're going to work on the bone regeneration and here are X, Y, and Z thought leaders. How, how does the whole process work with the teaming? We, we absolutely do not team. So we show no preference. We don't involve ourselves at all. What we do by virtue of Proposers Day and then a teaming profile page is essentially create and generate the opportunity for them to find what they need. So they if they say I'm good at A, B, and C, but I need D, they hopefully can look through the teaming page or have interacted with somebody at Proposers Day or inter interacted of their own accord with that group D. And they decide, hey, the, the two of us, the three of us, the four of us, whatever combination or permutation they find, will tackle TA1 and 2 or TA3 or all three. But it's up to them to figure out how they want to do that. And they put that in the proposal. So they indicate to us how they're going to actually accomplish the goals based on their capabilities. Excellent. And talk a little bit more about the, um, uh, I guess, the, the tier three, because the the ex vivo uh, replacement is, a, is is quite a, a unique concept. And we profile folks like uh, Tony Atala on the show, you know, trying to make uh, kidneys outside the body and Doris Taylor working on hearts. Again, take us through a, a, that because there is, uh, I, I, once again, I heard you present about this, but, you know, if it's between, hey, here's some titanium and here's a whole new joint I can give you. Yeah, there's there's some major wins there. Say a few words about tier three, if you would. Absolutely. Well, it might be worth taking a step back and just saying generally what we do in the program and what we don't do. Okay. So what we do is we, we define metrics. So I can say I want the therapeutic to look like A, B, and C, which is what's in the metrics table. So for TA3, for that total joint, again, two joints, both total mm -hmm. knee alloplasties or total knee replacements. Um, and what we're talking about is you need to produce a an allogeneic knee in less than 24 hours that requires no permanent fixation um is patient specific is osteochondroinductive so it generates those new osteoblasts and chondrocytes 
and gets the patient back to function within four to six weeks. Same thing applies then for the uh, autograft. So I'm just laying that framework to say, beyond that, it is absolutely up to the industry to say how we're going to accomplish or how they're going to accomplish the goals of this program. So they might say, we're going to use bioreactors, we're going to use this cell type or that scaffold, or they might say, we're going to do it in vivo approach, where it's entirely 3D bioprinting inside of the joint. They might say a, a variety of combinations or permutations. The real goal here is to convince us in proposal phase, at least, that what their approach is, is a good use of taxpayer dollars mm -hmm. and is a scientifically feasible way to get shots on goal and get the right shots on goal. So we, we are inherently non-prescriptive with the program so that we allow anyone in the industry to figure out maybe different ways to get to that end goal. Mm -hmm. it, it would be difficult. I have an idea of what I maybe it should look like, but that right. doesn't mean that it's the right idea. So that would mm -hmm. be a, a very myopic viewpoint for me to say it, it should be X. The only goal is based on all of our research and all of our data and the PhDs we have working in house and consulting with us. The metrics are created to make sure that it's an optimized end product for the patient and if mm -hmm. the, for the patient provider algorithm as, algorithm as well. It, per the uh, the in vivo approaches, the injectable bone and, and cartilage regeneration, are there any technologies that are uh, not allowed? I mean, is is, is gene therapy allowed? Uh, mRNA? I mean, is it sort of a, a a clean slate at this point on what a proposal can bring to the table? Um, CRISPR. <laughs> I'm just thinking of the different themes that uh, we've touched on on the show that uh, can potentially attack this problem. Everything's allowed as long as it can pass FDA and regulatory muster. Yeah. So it has yeah. to be something that's scientifically verifiable and that we can say there is basis for this to be plausible in the patient sector. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, yes, everything is viable. So whether it's gene therapy or cell therapy or chondrospheres or small molecules or pro anything you can think of that's a scientifically valid approach that could pass regulatory muster is totally fair game at this point. Again, they have to be able to convince us that it's a viable potential solution for the problem. Got it. So, um, once you had the proposers day, um, there's the broad agency announcement and then abstract submission and proposal uh, due dates are coming up. Any other important milestones per the next couple of months, uh, other proposer meetings, any, anything else happening per Nitro that we should know about in the, in the, in the coming weeks or months of the program? So once we pick proposers and we have a program up and running, there's going to be a lot more information that comes through our Twitter and our LinkedIn and on the website. And we're updating the website regularly. So there will absolutely be opportunities for people to keep track with what we're doing, where we are in the process. Uh, and that ties in also with patient engagement, provider engagement. But as of right now, it's, again, very early stages in the program. So we need to figure out where proposers are and what our proposer pool looks like before we can really start discussing the next steps. But generally speaking, in terms of the program, once we hit the ground running, it'll be 24 months of therapeutic discovery. During that time, what you might have seen in the BAA as well is that we have equity initiatives, which I wanted to mention because they're very important to us and very important to the overall mission of ARPA. Equitable access to these therapeutics is critical. Mm -hmm. So while it's great that we're talking about these very slick approaches to science, and I think they're all viable for what the end product could be, it's not so great if the end product costs a million dollars. Right. The disease distribution is greater than 50% female, primarily multi-race, not Hispanic, Native Alaskan, Native American. So our clinical trials, our therapeutics, everything that we produce has to match and serve those populations as well as the entire distribution of the disease. So it's even if it's a win technically, there are a lot of areas that we also have to win in. And those are the things we're approaching as well. Um, tying in with the equity in initiatives, tying in with our commercialization approach, again, Great if we can produce cool science, not so great if it doesn't actually benefit any patients. Mm -hmm. So we're considering all of these things, and we're going to be discussing a lot more as time goes on in terms of how we're approaching that to possibly benefit your listeners and any other members of the American public who are impacted by the disease. It is It does not discriminate. Not at all. And, and I guess you know, this is the, a side to but thinking back to your... Uh, your own journey in uh in maxillofacial surgery and everything obviously the 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 connections to other areas of, of bone regeneration whether it's in dental medicine or, or other aspects of of health and disease uh, there's probably a lot of spin-offs to this uh potentially um be i mean obviously not always a huge enough area but uh, uh there's uh there's a bunch of other potential 
uh wins let's say if you win when you win at this and so i, I think that makes it even uh, uh that much more exciting and just uh, speaks to the the moonshot nature uh the you know the big picture again that uh, that you take into account at rph it's, it's just exciting to see it uh to see, see it happening and again i know this is one of the first programs that's that's happening and uh it's great that it's happening so fast uh ever since you know the organization was begun um and anything <laughs> else ross that's it's going to be happening that we should know about uh whether it's Nitro or broader ARPA H um, that you want to mention, anything else I didn't touch on, please take the floor. Well, I absolutely leave it to ARPA H to announce the ARPA H stuff. But with, with respect to Nitro, you do bring up a good point that I, I think is worth reiterating. Osteoarthritis is a third leading cause of disability. It's a very valid target for what we're looking to do. But Nitro is also focused on platform therapeutics. So these are regenerative medicine approaches that are going to be applied to more than just bone and cartilage. My, my hope and my aim and my my vision personally is that this is just the beginning of what we can unlock, kind of akin to when NASA first started. Hopefully this is just the beginning of, hey, if we can get this right and we can accelerate these better health outcomes for everyone along the lines of osteoarthritis and then across arthritis and then across the populations who are impacted by diseases that necessitate or conditions that necessitate regenerative medicine, the hope is that this platform justifies those future platforms. Yeah. Um, and I would love to say that these therapeutics end up in my hands as a provider, and I'm using these in five years or six years, not just as a patient, but as a provider. And that's right. that would be a big personal win and professional win for me, even outside of the Nitro and RPH platform. Standing. Really, you know, I, again, very excited. Um, well, obviously, it's got to be since the beginning of RPH, but I'm so glad to see what you're doing, the speed, which you're moving this ahead and just uh, wishing the best as, uh, you know, the, the agency announcement proceeds and you get these initial proposals in. Um, but really, you know, what great stuff. Um, again, for everybody that is going to be listening uh, to this particular episode of our show uh, across the various podcast networks or watching on the YouTube channel, again, you've been listening to Dr. Ross Urich, Program Manager, Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health, leading the night program in this extremely uh, unmet area of, uh, of, of medical need. Um, I also want to thank you uh, for taking the time out of your schedule, obviously, to come talk to us for a little bit about what you're up to and the progress you're making. Obviously, thanks for everything you're doing. We should do an update episode in a few months to, as the proposals come in. But uh, as we say on our show, thanks so much uh, for creating a better tomorrow for all those patients out there uh, that require thank what you. you're doing. Really great story. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.